Welcome to this evening. My name is Lenny Mendoza. I'm the Governor Gavin Newsom's Chief Economic and Business Advisor and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. And tonight, I'm delighted to be on stage with Pulitzer Prize winning authors Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Duan. Nick and Cheryl are co-authors of five books, including the number one bestseller, Half the Sky, and most recently, this fabulous book, Tight Ropes, Ameri Tight Rope, Americans Reaching for Hope, a remarkably personal plea for a sink sinking population, working class Americans. The book explores major issues facing the United States, such as crime, poverty, and addiction, by presenting them through a series of intimate personal narratives found in communities across the country. Tightrope introduces readers to the individual, individuals and families who have suffered while most affluent Americans have looked the other way. Many of these stories are rooted right in Nick's own hometown of rural Yamhill, Oregon. <laughs> Got a Yamhill person here. Uh, through their writing, Nick and Cheryl call attention to the ways in which the nation is failing these blue collar communities while also highlighting stories of resilience and hope found despite crippling circumstances. Both Nick and Cheryl previously worked as reporters for the New York Times, writing about human rights and global affairs. Nick and Cheryl are the only married couple to share a Pulitzer Prize for journalism. In addition to their shared writing, Nick works as an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. I'm sure none of you read him. <laughs> uh, Cheryl now works in finance and consulting making real the things that she talks about. <laughs> We're thrilled to welcome Nick and Cheryl here to San Francisco tonight to discuss their lives, journalism, and their intimate experience of writing a book about the really important issue of the working class crisis occurring in both Nick's hometown and our nation's backyard. Please join me in welcoming and giving a warm welcome to Nick and Cheryl. So welcome to San Francisco, and Thank I know you. San Francisco is uh, its own unique place, but it's also a place that is a distinct population from the communities that you were writing about. So why don't, can you just start a little bit with why did you decide to do this book, and why now? Well, when we were foreign correspondents, uh, uh, you know, traveling around the world, uh, reporting on a lot of different things, including humanitarian crises, uh, we would come back every year. I've been going back to Yam Hill for decades, uh, and we would go back to the family farm, and we would, you know, talk to the people who not only grew up with Nick, but also who work on the family farm. And as we started, you know, talking to them, um, we realized that there was actually a humanitarian crisis in our own backyard that we had ignored for all these years. And so, you know, as we um, thought about writing a book, we started with the question, one of the questions was, uh, you know, why do people support Trump? It became much bigger than that because as we, as we discovered, once you sort of, you know, go behind the closed doors uh, that, you know, into many people's homes and they really start opening up to you, it took a long time to get these people to open up to tell some of these really sad stories. Um, we, it, it was heartbreaking because one thing that we realized was that here in the U.S., the wealthiest country in the world, we have running water, we have electricity, you know, uh, even these people may have flat screen TVs. On the other hand, you have uh, people in the developing world just scrambling to come to New York, to the, to the U.S. because they believe in the American dream. This is something that they care about. But these homegrown Americans who we, we have been talking to, uh, what they don't have that those other people have is that they don't have hope. They don't believe in the American dream because for them, that American dream is broken. So tell us a little bit about how you did the work to develop these stories and how you got people, as you said, to be willing to open up and talk to you about what was really going on in their lives and their community. Well, first as an Oregonian, let me just say I'm delighted to be on the right coast again. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, acknowledging that perhaps the epicenter of God's country is a little bit north of here. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, look, let me tell you a little bit about Yamhill. 
uh, a farm town, the very edge of the Lamette Valley, going into the coastal range, population of about a thousand on a on a good day. Um, <laughs> And traditionally, the economy was dependent on agriculture, timber, and light manufacturing. The biggest local employer was a glove factory. Um, and it, people had done extraordinarily well for most of the 20th century. It had prospered, families had risen, uh, and, then it, and then jobs, blue-collar jobs, kind of largely disappeared. The glove factory closed down, et cetera. Um, I'm close to the people on my old number six school bus. A uh, quarter of the people on my number six school bus are gone from uh, drugs, alcohol, suicide, and related pathologies, what, what are called deaths of despair. And those are symptoms of something broader and deeper that we see across the country. Um, the family that got on the bus right after me um, was the Knapps. Uh, five kids, their dad uh, laid, uh, had a union job laying sewer pipes. Um, they had bought their own home. They were doing well. Uh, when Farland turned 16, the uh, family scrimped and saved and bought him a Ford Mustang, and we were all incredibly jealous of Farlin. Um, and then, um, uh, then Farlin ended up, he was fired from his job, spiraled downward, uh, died of liver failure uh, associated with uh, drugs and alcohol. His uh, brother, Zeeland, died in a house fire while passed out drunk. His sister, Regina, uh, died of hepatitis from drug use. His brother Nathan uh, blew himself up cooking meth. And the only survivor of the five kids uh, was Keelan, who survived because he spent 13 years in the Oregon State Penitentiary. And here are five kids who I remember as smart, capable, um, immensely talented, and just gone one after the other. And at first, we didn't know how to process this. And then we gradually saw this was one example of this nationwide problem of deaths of despair. And, uh, that, and then I guess what really struck us as well was the consequences for kids in Yamhill and elsewhere. And Farlin, one of Farlin's daughters died at, at 29, drank herself to death. Uh, the other daughter, again, tremendously talented, is um, in jail for drug offenses. Um, and, you know, this, I, th I think maybe especially in San Francisco, people sometimes tend to think this is an inevitable consequence of automation and globalization. It's too bad, but these are larger forces. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. Other countries are also facing these challenges, and other countries are not seeing their life expectancy fall for three years in a row. This is fundamentally because of policy choices that we made as a country over the last 50 years, and uh, a lot of people are paying the price for them. So when you're in, in Yamhill, and it wasn't the only place where you saw this when you were doing the stories, did you have a sense that this was, if not an inevitable consequence of those circumstances, a sense that this is their <laughs> personal failing, a, a, it's their responsibility, and why, why why did that happen? Well, that was their, they just didn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps and, and deal with the issues. So, Lenny, that's a really interesting question because uh, basically uh, in the 1970s, up until from the World War II to the 1970s, we were really a very inclusive capitalism. Uh, you know, growth was uh, terrific, uh, the pie was expanding, and everyone got a larger slice of the pie. Uh, but by the 1970s, as the economy started to face challenges, uh, we, uh, it needed a kick in the butt. Uh, we deregulated. Uh, we actually uh, cut taxes. We also shifted power from unions to business. But we went too far. And at that time, that same time in the, in the 70s and the 80s, this new narrative, this social narrative of personal responsibility really started to grip the nation. 
Uh, and it really is premised on the idea that you are responsible for your own fate, your own destiny, and if you fall into a rut, you've got to get yourself out. And so this whole idea of lifting yourself up by the bootstraps, has anybody tried to do that? <laughs> You know, as physics majors will know, it, I don't think that it's really physically possible to do that. Um, in the 1800s, when the uh, phrase started uh, being used, it meant to do the impossible, because you can't do it. But somehow, in the 70s and 80s, it came to mean that, oh, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to lift yourself up by the bootstraps. And yes, of course, people have to take responsibility for their bad choices, their bad mistakes. Farland should not have dropped out of high school. He should not have started drugs. Um, yeah, but here we know that, you know, we give lots of people second, third, fourth chances. They go into bankruptcy, they get another chance. They go into bankruptcy, they get another chance. They can become president. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we really should give a lot of these other people second chances as well. And we can. It's not as though um, other countries, in the 1970s, we were very much in part of the pack of the OECD countries, very similar to Western Europe and to Canada in terms of health metrics, you know, social, lots of different social metrics, education levels. And then we started diverging. We actually started falling behind. And so if you look at, for instance, what happened um, after the financial crisis, it was very interesting. In Detroit, and in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, when the automakers laid off workers. We had a chance to see the difference. You know, how did Canada deal with it? How did the U.S. deal with it? So in the U.S., uh, workers got laid off. Uh, they, because of the unusual circumstances, they got a little bit more unemployment benefits, so they got more money. But they lost their job, and they lost their health care. Uh, and so, you know, that's really a terrible stressor on a family. Over in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, uh, yes, they lost their job, but they still had their health care uh, because of universal health care in Canada, and so they didn't have this extra stressor. On top of that, the government intervened and looked at, they sort of kicked into action, they looked around the local area for where the demand for jobs was. Well, it wasn't in the auto industry. It turned out there were some in nursing, so they actually put together programs to retrain these welders and these you know, auto technicians to go into nursing if they wanted those jobs. And so the result several years later is that not only did they get back into the workplace much more quickly, but they aren't self-medicating years later. They aren't lonely. They aren't uh, you know, uh, depressed. And we do have in this country the highest rate of su suicide since the World War II. Uh, and you know, it's part of the deaths of despair. And loneliness is becoming a huge factor. And loneliness, believe it or not, hurts your health. Um, it's the equivalent of fif smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That doesn't sound like a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're describing a situation that um, has been going on in the decaying of portions of urban America for quite a long time. And uh, it feels like something that now, and I don't know why, that it feels like the country is paying a lot more attention to issues of working class people and concerns about rural America. You know, it, it's a narrative of the presidential campaign already. It has been. So why are we paying attention to this now when this has been going on in urban America for a very long time? Um, so these are uh, issues that afflicted m many African American communities for decades. And the response from the public and from journalists was largely uh, buck up, or we need to use a law enforcement toolbox. Um, in the case of drugs, send people away forever. Um, we, uh, in the book, we contrast two people who were engaged in the narcotics trade in some form. One was a African-American woman named Geneva Cooley who had been struggling with addiction her whole life. She had a completely nonviolent history, uh, was caught uh, carrying drugs, was sentenced in Alabama to 999 years in prison. And then we called up the Sackler family <laughs> behind Purdue Pharma, which is infinitely more responsible for addiction in the United States and made $13 billion in the process and asked them what they thought about relative responsibility between themselves and Geneva Cooley. Um, they declined to comment. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that 
the, I think it's entirely correct that there is a uh, element of hypocrisy and a double standard in the uh, concern today for the white working class, where the black working class was, um, was, was cold shouldered for decades. Um, I do think that there, while it's hypocritical, that there may now be some greater political opportunity to have more humane and compassionate policies as more um, white Americans are suffering from them. And if, if the result finally is that we offer treatment for drugs rather than just locking people up, if it's that we use the public health toolbox, that we emphasize early childhood interventions, uh, job retraining, uh, then, you know, then I think that would be great. But is it hypocritical? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I want to get more into the depths of despair before we get into what we can do about it. So um, was there something distinct about the rural context of America that makes this deeply problematic and more so than other countries or urban environments? You, you mentioned a little bit of policy, but is there something about the isolation, the lack of connection? What, what is it about wor rural working poor that make this challenging? Well, I mean, there has been sort of a, just a migration from, you know, agricultural jobs to, you know, manufacturing jobs. And the problem is it's geo-based. So when you uh, lose a huge factory like the glove factory, it's not as though uh, there is a lot of opportunity if that was the main employer in town. And, you know, people are relatively mobile, but, you know, you know a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of these people, if they're so poor to move, is a huge decision for them, if, especially if they have a home that's been in the family for a long time. They've got a place to live. It's bought and paid for already. They don't have to, you know, worry about that. But, yes, some of them did move. They went to Idaho to look for jobs. And then after the financial crisis, uh, when those jobs dried up, they came back and they returned. Um, but, you know, it is, uh, it, it does have to do with disappearing jobs because that, the jobs issue, lack of jobs triggers this problem. And we, so there's been a lot of talk about universal basic income and, you know, will that, you know, be an antidote? And to that, I, we say that it's a first step. It's not the be-all, end-all. First of all, there is research in other countries in Europe that have actually tried uh, UBI and, you know, it's mixed, it, it doesn't have a great record so far. Uh, but also we discovered that um, you know, a job is not just to bring in money. It's also, it gives you identity, it gives you purpose, it gives you a, a sense of well-being. So it's far more than just the income. So a UBI will give you some money and it, it will appease you, but it's not gonna fulfill those other uh, you know, lacks that really um, you know, prevent people from descending into loneliness, despair, and deaths of despair. Okay. Um, the picture on the front of this book is your hometown. It's the Anthill. It, it looks like it could be any place in rural America or a part of America where the jobs have gone south and there's a sense of lack of hope or optimism. Um, when you visited other cities as well as Yamhill, do they describe the same things in terms of their, you just, you, you're, you coined this term and you talk about it. What, how do they describe it? Is there something in common about their lack of hope and despair? Or? I think the commonalities are uh, striking. I mean, after, when Cheryl and I began talking about the book, people kept coming up to us and saying, you know, I'm from Maine, I'm from Kentucky, I'm from Ohio, from Texas, where my, and my town is going through the same issues. And um, I should also say, I, 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 uh, I don't want to give people the wrong idea about Yam Hill. I mean, this is a, it was actually kind of a challenge in writing it because we don't want to leave people with the impression that this is a, a town that is where everybody is cooking meth or struggling. It's a, a town that in many ways has uh, thrived with the wine industry. And there are par parts of Yam Hill that have done exceptionally well. But just as America managed to combine areas of enormous success and areas of great suffering, that's true at a micro level of Yam Hill and of so many other communities around the country. Um, and I think that one of the, um, I think that's one of the things that has been hardest for these, for those folks who've been left behind. That, you know, in many ways, this is a little like the Great Depression for some of these people. Um, 
and in some ways, arguably even magnified. In the Great Depression, life expectancy actually rose by six years. These days, because of these deaths of despair, life expectancy for America as a whole has fallen for three years in a row until it, it nudged up uh, just a, a hair in 2018. And in the Great Depression, you had a government that launched a new deal, uh, really tried very hard to address it. And it feels, I think, for a lot of people who've been left behind that these days the government and much of the population is not helping. In some ways, it's magnifying the problems. And that much of the population is largely indifferent to the struggles to people left behind. And I think that is one reason why some of these communities have been uh, why they ended up uh, voting for Donald Trump, including Yamhill, and including so many of these other communities. Actually, if you overlay a map of where the deaths of despair are, are, are the largest, uh, you can, it is in rural areas, um, many poorer areas, and you overlay it with, uh, you know, counties that went for Trump, it's very, very similar. Okay, I will note we're 40 minutes into this talk before that name was mentioned, so we'll try and keep this on, yeah. on different topics. But uh, so I want to try and move a little bit to uh, you mentioned the New Deal, which just for a little historical random footnote, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt announced the New Deal at the Commonwealth Club. Oh. So, um, but you know there there are uh, stories of both at the individual community level, and then let's come back to broader policy of resilience and hope that are going on despite that challenge. And so it's not just bootstrapping, but there are things going on that give you a sense of ultimately this isn't a hopeless cause. These are things that we can do something about. So tell us a little bit about places where, or examples where you thought there was something. This is, a, this is something that gives us a sense of why isn't everybody doing this? Well, one of the most um interesting programs that we saw was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, you know, basically, um, there, uh, you know, of the people who, 68,000 people last year died of, um, died from drug overdose. And 10% uh, of the people who, who, who are, have substance abuse get treatment. So if you think about if 10% of the people who have diabetes, only 10% got insulin, I mean, you know, we need to look at this as a disease because it has become it, it does it has become a disease uh, the, the addiction. Um, so what uh, this program in Tulsa does it's called Women in Recovery, and it looks at women who are basically sentenced to to jail, about to about to go to prison, uh, and it says if the underlying cause for their committing the crime really has to do more with an addiction, sending them to jail, locking them up is not going to solve that problem. But what would is a rehabilitation program, a rehab program. So they will actually divert the woman. She has to agree totally. She has to basically commit herself to 18 months to two years of you know, day in, day out, you know, full-time job. This is your mission for the next two years. And so basically, th they run her through a program that includes intensive psychotherapy. And they've told us that the, the therapy was so important for them to really get at the root causes of why they were making these bad decisions. And then they have them all sorts of classes, even morality classes. I mean, they have to teach them, you know, it's better not to sell that bag of drugs for $1,000 and to work for $15 an hour in this job in the donut shop. <laughs> so, you know, it, it really teaches them, you know, why you should do, do certain things. And it also gives them business skills training. Uh, they learn resume writing, which they've never, ever done. And they give, get apprenticeships so that they can then get a job and they, W the program works with local employers who are willing to hire, you know, ex-convicts, you know, and so they get placed often in, in, in jobs, and after 18 months to two years, they are productive members of society. So this program saves uh, the city money because instead of having them locked up and the costs incurred, you know, in the jail are very high. Um, and over the years, this program has been in existence and turning these women into productive members of society. They've saved about $70 million. So this is a really good program that, you know, it's run by, it's financed by private philanthropy. So it does need to scale. And, you know, this is the kind of thing where you kind of really do need government intervention because, you know, we can't build a nationwide program uh, like this, um, you know, with private philanthropy. It's, 
you know, you, you wouldn't build Amtrak, you know, uh, <laughs> railroad, you know, with, you know, e private philanthropy financing, you know, their four, 400 yards. So, you know, it does need um, uh, intervention. And this was in Kansas, you said? This was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh, Oklahoma, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Flyover states, they're all the same. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, that's a joke. That's not, I'm not serious about that. But, I um, mean, Oklahoma is, a, is not exactly a liberal kind of feel-good no, place. No, no. And, and uh, so that actually gives us a lot of hope because, you know, it is a model, role model. And, you know, some, a lot, number of other cities are using what they call lead programs where they're trying to divert people from, you know, going to jail if the real underlying reason is that they need rehabilitation. I mean, our whole concept, and this is where the policymaking uh, was mistaken, you know, decades ago when they started this policy of, you know, locking people up just for small amounts of drugs and, and also, you know, leading to mass incarceration. So it, it you know, our, our concept of, of prison is very different in, in parts of Western Europe particularly, um, you know, in the Nordic countries, they see prison as a place for rehabilitation. I mean, the whole point of prison is to rehabilitate the, the prisoner so that they can actually become released and become a fully productive member of society, get them back on track in society. We, there are efforts to do, do that, sort of pockets where, you know, uh, people are trying to do that, but it's not systematic. Hmm. I guess I got confused because when you said Tulsa, I thought you said Kansas City, which I thought was <laughs> Kansas, not Missouri. Yeah. Sorry, but um, the Tulsa Chiefs. <laughs> yes. Um, are are these examples isolated examples, or do we have evidence and data that any of these things actually work, and we can have a sense of a factual conversation about the possibilities? One of the great differences from now compared to 20 years ago is that we do have robust data, and there have been a lot of interventions that have been rolled out as randomized controlled trials. Uh, so you have a sense of what an intervention will do, at what cost, and <coughs> that's fundamentally reassuring. You know, the other countries have tackled these same challenges. Some parts of the country have very successfully ta uh, tackled these challenges, and we know that they can be done. And, you know, even if you take, um, Homelessness is about as obdurate a challenge as one can face. It's one that San Francisco is obviously very familiar with. Um, and the, as a country, we were kind of shamed by veteran homelessness. Uh, in, as a result, in 2010, the Obama administration launched a major initiative to end veteran homelessness. Well, we didn't end it. But over six years, we reduced it by half. And it's a reminder that we have toolboxes that can make a huge difference. Not, there's no silver bullet for any of these challenges, but there is, in a sense, there's silver buckshot. And if we were likewise shamed by our levels of child homelessness, by the fact that 1.5 million kids over the course of a year will at some point be homeless, then we could likewise reduce child homelessness by perhaps half. Uh, there was a good uh, National Academy studies about how we could reduce uh, child poverty in America by half at $100 billion a year, but we choose not to make that a priority. And I guess that's one of the things that we find so frustrating. Um, you know, Ben Carson has talked about saying poverty is really just a choice. <laughs> you know, in one respect, he's right. It is a choice, not by a child. You know, when you, can, when, you can say, when you can predict an infant's outcome based on the zip code in which they are born, that is not because this infant is making bad choices. <laughs> but it is because society is making bad choices about the opportunities that it is willing to provide that infant. And so, fundamentally, I think we have the policy toolboxes and it becomes a question about our priorities, what we are willing to tolerate, and um, whether we are willing to, uh, to make different choices as a country. Just a reminder to those in the audience, I'm getting a number of question cards, but if you have a question, please uh, write it, and I'll try and weave them into the conversation that we've got for the next half an hour or so. I'm already looking at them. There's a whole series of fan mail questions here that I'll just leave for you afterwards, but... Um, let me, uh, let me 
build off of what you, you both said about that was a wonderful story in Tulsa and that there's more evidence that there's data that these working. So why isn't this scaling? What is it that's holding us back from making Tulsa and the examples of what can happen on veterans homelessness? Why, why do those feel like that's a great column or a great story and it does it feels like an exception rather than the norm? Well, I would say two things, and I know Nick will also have some thoughts on this. Um, first of all, you know, I think that uh, we uh, think that, you know, this is not a national problem. Uh, and that here we've got this rocking economy, um, you know, you just heard <laughs> the State of the Union, but this is the best economy ever uh, and um, in the history of the world. And um, so, you know, how could you have this problem going on in, 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 in the U.S.? And in fact, it's, it's very true we do have this problem. I mean, the, if you look at some of the graphs that we have in tightrope, one, the top 1% basically, start, you know, 20, in 1980 had about 10% uh, uh, of the share of income. Now it's 20%. The bottom 50% of uh, you know national in share of national income, bottom 50% had 20, and now they're down at 10. So they clearly have lost ground. Whereas in Europe, uh, the numbers are about the same. You know, the 10% stay, the top percent, top 1% stay at about 10, and the the bottom 50% stay at about 20. I mean, it's a little bit uh, changed, but the, not no crossover. So we are an outlier, and so the question is. Um, Competition. If we're going to compete in the global world, we should care more about this because, you know, if you know, if we don't have all Americans firing on all c cylinders, we're just not going to be able to compete with China, 1.4 billion people, and India, soon to have 1.4 billion people. It's sort of like what. So Bill Gates, when he was visiting uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, he was speaking to an audience, and two thirds of the audience were men. There was a physical barrier, and then the other third were women, and they were covered. But the women and the men were not supposed to be in the same room, which is why there was a physical barrier. So this man uh, stood up and said, Mr. Gates, we have a goal here in Saudi Arabia of becoming one of the top 10 economies in the world. Do you think we'll make it? And he said, he, as he looked out the audience, Bill Gates said, if you are not fully utilizing half the resources in your country, there is no way you will get anywhere near the top 10. And it's the same with the US. If we are not fully utilizing the f potential of so many Americans, we're just not going to stay number one. Well, actually, if we think that we, we are number one, we're actually not number one in a lot of things, but um, <laughs> we won't recover uh, the, the mantle of being number one. I thought you said it was the greatest country in the history of the world, the greatest <laughs> economy. Uh, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, let me just add uh, you know, a couple of things that I see as impediments, why we don't actually do scale these things, do these things. And, um, one, I think, you know, I, I think, frankly, one of the problems is that on both left and right, we are now just so focused on President Trump and, you know, this week the impeachment trial. But it kind of, he kind of sucks all the oxygen out of the room. And at the end of the day, these are problems that preceded Donald Trump that will be around after he is gone. And Trump is absolutely important. I mean, I'm writing about him all the time. But he's not the only thing that's important. And we have to preserve some bandwidth for the fact that we lose more Americans every two weeks from alcohol, drugs, and suicide than we lost in 18 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, you know, we've got a one question is kind of the bandwidth issue, putting these issues on the agenda. And I think another is the social narratives that we have. And Cheryl mentioned this, you know, this, this obsession with personal responsibility, with a bootstraps narrative. And I think that that has become a impediment toward more compassionate approaches. One of the con problems is that it has become absorbed by those themselves who were left behind and internalized uh, by them. Um, and it is often paired with a narrative since the Reagan era uh, that uh, people, it's all about rugged individualism and the government is inevitably part of the problem. And, you know, look, uh, in Oregon, we were very much nurtured on the legends of the pioneers crossing the country and their courage and heroism and individualism. And all, all that was completely true. But, you know, why did the pioneers cross the country and end up in 
the Willamette Valley or in California because of a government benefit program. Because when they crossed the country, if they got to the Willamette Valley, they got 640 acres of land. And that was an extraordinarily wise investment in disadvantaged Americans. A quarter of white families in America owe part of their family wealth to the homestead programs. And then Yamhill and so much of, of the country was transformed by America uh, becoming the first country in the world to make mass uh, secondary education. Uh, very, if not universal, very widespread, uh, by rural electrification, later by the GI Bill of Rights. And those were programs that invested in America's human capital in ways that laid the groundwork for, in, for economic growth and for inclusive economic growth. Um, so, look, you know, this... The narrative about personal responsibility, I mean, there is absolutely something to that. I mean, it's, it's perfectly valid to, to have those conversations. But if we're going to have the conversation about personal responsibility, then we also have to have a conversation about our collective social responsibility, especially to help children. So uh, building on that, I'm going to combine a couple questions and put a little harder edge on them than the, the writer said. So uh, there's a, a narrative out that capitalism is broken, and there's no possible way we're going to get through this without either a fundamental reboot of capitalism or give up on it and go to something else. Uh, what Do you have a perspective on are there, is capitalism to blame? Is there a possibility? And are there companies that are part of the solution, or should we just give up on it and go to socialism? Right, right. Um, you know, I, I do think that capitalism, uh, you know, is the best thing that we have so far. And But it's a living, breathing model. We write rules all the time. We rewrite rules all the time. And we should continue to rewrite rules. And that's it, the rules are sort of the, the guideposts that guide capitalism. We can change them. I mean, it was Milton Friedman who sort of really popularized this idea of shareholder capitalism. And it was needed at the time. We, we needed to, you know, jumpstart and, you know, kick the economy in the butt. We needed it. But now we need something else. So we need someone else to come out and say, we need stakeholder capitalism. And, you know, People are talking about it now. We need to figure out better ways to implement. It's harder. Uh, we need the, the markets to sort of say, well, wait a second. We're not just going to, you know, um, you know, give the company a star rating if uh, it rewards only shareholders. But you know, we have to look at stakeholders because ultimately, you know, workers are very important too. I think we've moved the other direction where we've given so much uh, power to companies and so little power to unions uh, that the worker right, I mean, the worker rights just really don't exist. And so that's why the minimum wage, uh, if you look at 1968 uh, minimum wage, uh, if you account uh, you know, for inflation and productivity gains now, um, it should be about $22 an hour. What is it? It's $7.25, I mean, you know, fifteen dollars in parts of California. Uh, oh yes, yes. <laughs> so California is setting, and and the states have been raising the minimum wage in the state, so that's really good. But the federal minimum wage is still seven twenty-five. In fact, if you are a couple, man and wife, who are working minimum wage jobs full time, uh, and you have two kids and you need a two-bedroom apartment, there is no place in the entire country where you can rent a two-bedroom apartment and not pay more than the stipulated, you know, 30% gross income guidelines. So, I mean, you know, that's, you know, that is a matter of zoning. Uh, zoning is a really big issue uh, and makes it very difficult for uh, affordable housing to be built. And so we do need to rewrite some of the rules. I mean, we, um, you know, instead of huge tax cuts to corporations, what if we had given smaller tax cuts and then actually shared it a little bit more equitably? There, there are decisions that we can make, and those were decisions that were, were, were written into law. We can rewrite them. Okay. If we're actually going to do some rewriting, um, what's at the top of your list of things that would make a difference to try and move the needle on these issues? So programmatically, the three, I guess my three top priorities would be uh, early childhood education, and the evidence is just overwhelming about the benefits of early childhood interventions for the children and also for low-income folks who want to work 
the fact that that provides childcare. Um, so that would be at the top of my list. There's a lot of studies that when, when targeted, that it pays for itself several times over. Uh, another would be uh, treating drugs uh, and addiction with, with, not with locking people up, but with treatment programs. And again, pretty good evidence that this pays for itself many times over. One study suggests every dollar put in treatment uh, saves uh, $12 in uh, criminal justice and, and health costs. Um, and a third would be um, job training and retraining. One of the things that I think Cheryl and I found particularly illuminating was what happened to uh, auto workers in the 2008-2009 uh, economic crisis in Detroit and just across the border in Windsor, Ontario. And look, they were laid off because of larger economic forces. Uh, on the U.S. side, they got extended unemployment benefits. On the Canadian side, they, for starters, they did not lose their health insurance, which was crucial. And secondly, the Canadian government, Ontario government, moved in very, very rapidly to provide uh, retraining. And it said, okay, you know, you've been a, a welder for 25 years. We look ahead. We're not going to need a lot of welders in Ontario. We are going to need a lot of healthcare workers. Um, you interested in nursing? Um, you know, here's what you might earn in nursing. Okay, we can put you in a new class on Monday, and you'll study nursing, and, you know, here's what you'll learn, and then every Wednesday you'll go to such and such a hospital. And, and, and this basically worked. And the upshot today is that those you know, Ford auto workers who were laid off on the Windsor side are less enmeshed in these larger um, crises and the unraveling of the social fabric than those on the, on the Detroit side. So job, uh, job training and retraining are something that uh, European countries in particular have done much, much better than the U.S. That would be high on my list. And I would add to the job retraining, job creation. I mean, that, that's really ultimately what it comes down to is, is creating jobs, whether it's green jobs or just, you know, jobs that will actually allow people who could be, you know, uh, send them through retraining so that they can actually uh, have jobs in, in, their, in their area. Okay. This, that sounds like a pretty robust agenda for, say, a presidential election or a candidate. How, how are you feeling about, not individual candidates, but how are you feeling about this agenda being pursued in Washington, or short of moving to Canada, what can we do to try and have Windsor be the natural experiment that we're excited about in the US as opposed to in Canada? Let me actually be, no, I'm actually, you know, um, I, I, I actually think there is a ray of hope. Um, I mean, I think this on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I think it's suicidal. <laughs> but, um, you know, for the last, I mean, so we argue that basically the U.S. took a wrong turn over the last 50 years under presidents of both parties, Congresses of both parties, um, that diverged from the OECD pattern, uh, and that involved typically cutting taxes and uh, cutting investments in human capital and in uh, social safety nets. That kind of reached its apex in Kansas under Governor Sam Brownback a few years ago, you may remember. And the upshot was that Kansas schools suffered so much that Kansas Republicans rebelled and said, no, tax us more. <laughs> um, and I thought that, that, I wonder if that may not be remembered by historians looking at that trend as, as a turning point, when Americans kind of understood that there is a bottom, that we actually do get something back from taxes. And likewise, you've seen in some other red states, some progressive movements. Uh, Texas was a leader in r moving away from mass incarceration. Uh, you have red states like uh, Utah, like Idaho, expanding Medicaid. And among, uh, even among many social conservatives, there's a real element of economic liberalism. And so when you ask people about uh, raising the minimum wage, about parental leave programs, about investments in early childhood, about uh, uh, you know, access uh, to broader access to the internet, then these poll incredibly well. 
And so I, at least in my more optimistic moments, uh, and this again I think is tied to the fact that uh, it is now, that, that the old kind of racialized politics that argued ever since Nixon's Southern strategy that, oh, if you have benefit programs, it's going to be African Americans who are going to benefit, that that no longer uh, that no longer strikes such a chord in many parts of the country because there are so many white Americans who've been struggling. Now, I think that has changed the, the politics to some degree in, some, in, some, in, in a number of states. So I, th I, um, I think there may be a certain opportunity for more progressive politics that with the right uh, president, and with the right Senate, <laughs> um, just perhaps can take us um, some steps forward. And it, I should also say it'll be important when some states, some progressive states, um, model uh, that behavior, you know, maybe with the right governor and economic advisor. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... Um it's today, it's today's Tuesday, right? Still, I'm trying to remember what day this has been such a long week already. Um, so that would be your pessimistic day today. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, so we, we are in one of those progressive states and also a place where half the venture capital in the country comes. So uh, is there a role for innovation in all of what we're talking about? Or are we just destined to be hoping for a terrific new president and a terrific Senate and an aligned house? And... You know, this is the age of innovation, not just in, uh, you know, te technology and in, in corporate America, but also uh, in uh, the social, uh, you know, uh, social tools, you know, tools that basically are, uh, you know, made to address social problems. There is so much innovation, so much research at universities that are, people want to solve these problems and they have great ideas and great experiments. So the Women in Recovery is one such experiment in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There are other, um, you know, there are lead programs around the, the country that are beginning to, they're, they're still being financed by private philanthropy. They don't get the state funding. Um, you know, because uh, people want, uh, you know, immediate fixes, you know, homelessness, please just get them out of downtown whatever, downtown city A. Um, you know, you're, it's kind of like a J-curve effect. You're going to have to invest money first, you know, to get something, uh, a long-term solution. If you just, like, ship them out of town, that's just shipping the problem somewhere else. It's sort of like, you know, uh, the cat in the hat comes back. You know, that pink, you know, ring around that bathtub goes from, you know, the bedroom to, to the wall, to the dress, to the, to the snow outside until it finally gets, you know, solved. You have to solve the problem. Uh, and so I do think that, um, you know, there are a number of things that, that uh, you know, that we can harness from the current state of, innovation in this sphere. I mean, you know, um, early childhood education, there's so much, uh, you know, research going on there. The tools that, you know, y y even here in California, uh, you know, your new Surgeon General, Nadine Burke Harris, she's got her f fingers on, you know, on, on all of the latest research that will address issues facing uh, childhood, you know, adverse experiences and how to, uh, how to address those issues. There's no lack of that. It's just the lack of political will to actually implement these on larger scales. Okay. So, Nick, I'm going to challenge you then with a question around, say you had a progressive governor in a progressive state with a opportunity to actually do some of the things that you're most interested in. Could they do it on their own? Do they need to have asked the federal government for permission? And what would you, what would you encourage them to do? So uh, there are some issues. I mean, homelessness is one of the challenges. It's harder to address at a local or state level, partly because of the challenge of... of that a, a more enlightened policy tends to draw people from states that are less enlightened. And, and some localities, as you know, now uh, give people bus tickets uh, to kind of move them on. Um, but on other issues, early childhood, um, uh, to some so drug treatment, um, job training, I think there really are opportunities and we need these experiments to model both what works and also the politics and how one makes uh, these arguments. Um, and I think that states can also 
work on changing the social narratives that I, we think are, are so important. Um, can, I, can I tell you a, a happy, optimistic California story? Sure. So um, <laughs> this, uh, this is actually the perfect location to, to tell it. Um, so there's a, a girl named Mary uh, growing up in St. Louis and very talented, um, but her, her dad is a postal worker and her parents are going through a divorce in her teenage years, a very traumatic divorce. Uh, she, a, as a consequence, uh, she ends up dropping out of school at age 15. Uh, she works for a donut shop. She, her life ambition at this point is to become a bus driver in St. Louis. But the uh, school encourages Mary to take the GED. She does. A local college teacher named Betsy Bain uh, encourages her, she does very well in the GD, you know, at least you know, take a, go to college, take a college class. And Mary said, ah, you know, I can't, I can't afford that. I'm working in a donut shop. And, and Betsy Bain says, well, uh, I'll pay for your first semester of college. And at that point, of course, this is years ago, college is more affordable. It's easier to work your way through. Um, so Mary goes first semester, does very well, went to scholarship. Um, studies economics, and uh, earns her BA, uh, a master's, a PhD, uh, and then uh, goes to work for the Federal Reserve System, and Mary Daly now works yep. right next to us in the Federal, she's president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, focusing on inequality. <laughs> and, you know, the larger lesson from that is that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. And that there are so many other Mary Daly's out there who are still working in donut shops and still uh, driving buses. And if we can invest in that human capital and give them opportunities, they're not the only ones who benefit. We all benefit as a society when talents are better deployed. And there's a lot of talk about econo economic competitiveness now. I mean, if we want to ensure our ec economic competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China, that's not going to come from tougher negotiations with Beijing about intellectual property negotiations. It's going to come from investing in the human capital of American kids. That's great. Thank you. And uh, we're also going to give Mary a copy of your book and tell her that story. <laughs> so that's fantastic. And she's in the book as a story. She's in the book, yeah. yeah that's yeah. great. Um, so we're getting closer to the end. I want to ask you a few more questions and then uh, let you catch the plane that you need to do. So you're um, three weeks or so into this book tour and traveling around the country telling these stories. We also happen to be you know, into a election season where people are talking about different things. What's the reaction been when you're having these conversations around the country? You know, we've actually been uh, amazed at even some of our friends who we had no idea. Oh, I'm from East Tennessee, and this is like my hometown. I'm from upstate New York, and this is exactly like my hometown. Um, and so, you know, it's clearly, you know, resonating with people uh, because it is happening more across the country. It's not just Yamhill, and I think that that's really what's important. Um, but I also think that, you know, we started asking, when we started the reporting for the book, we sort of asked, you know, why are these people supporting Trump? What is, what is the ultimate reason? And it, it ultimately became much more than that because the book just, you know, reflects just the, the pain and suffering that we saw. Uh, but, you know, you know, they, they do, um, you know, have their particular reasons for, for supporting him. And so, you know, w we think that, there, you know, the, whatever the candidate is, uh, the nominee uh, in the Democratic Party, I mean, needs to really talk to these people, reach out to these people, and I don't think that they have yet. I mean, I don't think that they actually have s focused on the working class. I mean, there's a lot of talk about the middle class, uh, and that's all good and fine, but I think the working class is the one that helped, you know, elect Donald Trump, and I think that, you know, if they don't feel that they're being listened to, then, you know, they're going to still stick by him, and you know I can s totally understand why. Uh, you know we haven't, um, you know, really listened to the working class. 
in reporting a lot of it, the reason people talk to us um, is that for the first time, you know, someone was listening to them and caring about what's happening to them. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, said, you know, I am willing to share my story because I want other people to avoid the same path that I took. And this is my way of giving back. So I do think that there's, we need to listen to them. That's great. Um, Nick, I grew up in one of those towns too, in Turlock, California, which is about two hours from here. And we're sitting in the, what would be the richest state in the country in Silicon Valley and in Turlock and Central Valley would be the poorest state in the country. So these are close yet so far away. Um, you know, when you're telling these stories, do people in New York City or Boston or San Francisco feel like I'm closer and want to be more engaged in this? Or is it just like, you know, great book club conversation, but then I'll go back to doing what I was doing before? To be frank, I think it's often um, a little like when I was writing about South Sudan and people are concerned and they think it's too bad, but it feels like a different planet. And I think that there's also a sense that just as what happened in South Sudan was unfortunate but would not particularly affect their lives, there's a sense that it's unfortunate what is happening in some of these parts of America, but that they won't really affect what happens in the first class cabin. And I think that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, I think that President Trump's election is in some ways a refutation of that idea. And you know, there is a precedent for a great superpower that saw life expectancy falling, <coughs> and uh, that was the Soviet Union. The Soviet response was to, to try to, well, close liquor stores, not to see these as symptoms of a much deeper malaise, and, and worse, to uh, stop releasing mortality data. <laughs> um, that's not an effective response. <laughs> you have to be deeper responses. And um, I hope that we can uh, summon the political will to actually address these in a more fundamental and, and humane way. That's great. Can I ask you um, one fo quick follow-up question? Because I saw the question, I have to ask it. Are there yams in Yam Mill? <laughs> <laughs> um, no yams. Um, uh, it, it's, it comes from a, the name of, uh, of the Yam Hill Indians, which is a corruption of, uh, their, of their name. OK. Well, I answered that question, so if you ever <laughs> ask that question, there's your answer. So um, I want to ask you um, to take this a little bit more personal now. So um, you were engaged with deep conversations with people with really challenging lives. Do you follow up with them? Do they, how do you deal with the fact that this is a human being on the other end of your storytelling? We actually have um, with a number of them, not all of them, but we have been in touch with a number of them. and. Um, it's very encouraging to hear uh, that uh, you know they're uh, they're doing well. They're still doing well. Some of the people in the uh, women in recovery program we've been in touch with, and in a whole bunch of areas. And um, we're going back to Oregon next weekend, so we I will know. have a f be able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with some of these people. So that's great. C can I just add that you know this was a much tougher book to write than those we did previously because. Um, you know, when you're doing an interview in a refugee camp, you have this sort of protective armor. Um, when you're talking to old friends, you don't have any armor at all. And we worried about what old friends, you know, how they would see themselves when they read about themselves. They confided to us. They were, they were truly wonderful about discussing issues in a very rounded way. And we, want, we didn't want to leave things out. We wanted to fully depict um, some things that were embarrassing and humiliating on their part. And we, we worried about that. We also worried about you know, how people in places like San Francisco <laughs> would see some of our old friends. And one of our, you know, one of our dear friends, uh, Clayton, is pictured in the book and you'll see him he's 400 pounds he's obese he's for a while he cooked meth and i was af we were afraid that people would kind of pigeonhole him 
in this stereotype. And in fact, he's this incredibly loyal friend, a brilliant mechanic, very complicated guy. And uh, so we, we worried about, you know, that we would feed problematic narratives rather than refute them. Um, but, um, you know, uh, so far the, the, the folks in Yamhill have, the response has been great. We are, we're going to speak in the local county seat on uh, Friday evening, and we've reserved a, you know, seat in the front row for the kid who, was uh, closest, who, who grew up in the house very closest to me uh, growing up, who's now homeless in the, in the park outside the library. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's hard to write about people that you care about very deeply, about a community that you love very much, uh, that you don't, that you care about how people perceive it. And, um, and, and, you know, people like Mike, this friend who's homeless, they don't want your sympathy. Uh, they want your respect. They want dignity. And our big challenge was how do we convey that complexity and give them that, that dignity and that respect. That's that's powerful and look forward to hearing your stories after you come back and what it's like to go back. Um, this is the unfortunate time where we're just about at the end of the program and I uh, would, as I suspect all of you would, would love to spend several more hours talking with Cheryl and Nick about, about their work, their book, their stories, their ideas, and their passion. But we're unfortunately just about at the end of the time and I promised them they would catch their flight. <laughs> so. Um, I want to ask you one last question before thanking you for spending your evening with us in San Francisco. And it's, it's um, if you have a group of people in the audience or listening or your readers who say, oh, I totally get this. I want to do something. This is personal to me. You know, this isn't a theoretical policy question. I want to do something. What, would, what advice would you give to people who said, I don't, want to, I don't want this narrative to be the narrative anymore? Well, um in the back of the book, we actually have the 10 things that you could do. So there are, com in 10 minutes, so there are some really quick things that you could do. Um, Reach Out and Read is an organization that really helps uh, prescribe reading uh, to uh, young mothers with, you know, infants, basically, to get them on the right track uh, when they probably otherwise would go on the wrong track. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's really just sort of shining a light through your own, you know, social network, your own you know, uh, uh, friends and, you know, talking about this. You know, we really want to sort of generate conversation about this issue and that it become something that, you know, people talk about and decide whether or not it's something that they care about. Do they care about their society? And uh, is this something that they can, you know, go beyond what they, you know, currently normally do? Um, writing to your Congress representative, it sounds so traditional and old-fashioned, but you know, when lobbyists get the ears of the, the Congress uh, representatives and no one else does but lobbyists, you know, who are they gonna listen to? Uh, the lobbyists, and so I think it really uh, would be great if or they hear much more from ordinary um, Americans and they don't have to be in your own hometown. It could be, you know, um, Congress representatives in other, in other states, maybe Kentucky and you know, <laughs> maybe in the Senate and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just randomly, just <laughs> to pick a place. Yeah, uh, as Cheryl mentioned, the, at the very end of the book, we list 10 things you can do in the next 10 minutes. And, you know, there are things like mentoring, and uh, you can even do it online with iMentor, uh, which seems like a very San Francisco thing to suggest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, I'd likewise emphasize the advocacy things, groups like Results, dot uh, org because we you know we've we've seen how donations and especially in education can have a completely transformative effect on people and their group there we have friends uh, Drew Goff who we write about who uh, because they got help their <coughs> lives and their kids lives were, were transformed and that's fantastic but the reason we mention advocacy is that these have to be broader. And Carol alluded to this earlier, but you know, 
one of the great things this country did was the interstate highway system, but we didn't do that with volunteers and people writing checks to sponsor a square meter of highway. Um, <laughs> that would be crazy. And in the same way, when we have tens of millions of kids who need support, when we've got millions of folks who are wrestling with some of these addictions, then it's crazy just to uh, try to address these with volunteers and philanthropy. It's, you know, thank goodness we have that, but let's also try to address this more systematically. That's terrific. So I'd like to remind everyone, if you're in the room, that this amazing book, Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope, is available as uh, pre-signed copies in the back of the room. And if you're not in the room and you'd still like to purchase, it's absolutely available on your favorite local bookstore, uh, in addition to those that can ship it to you. Uh, <laughs> by tomorrow, if you really want to read it. So, uh, listen, on uh, behalf of myself, Lenny Mendoza, the Commonwealth Club, and all of those here and those listening, just want to join us in giving a big round of applause and appreciation for Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for joining us, and this edition of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>